Okay. Right. So, um, so we, we've been looking at uh, types of uh, uh, the different ways by which we can study the Word of God. We've already established that the Word of God is something that needs to be the content of what we are preaching and what we are um, declaring. And then we we saw that um, you know uh, the importance of that. Right, that we cannot do away with that, uh, the importance of the Word of God and how the Word of God is what will bear fruit, bring fruit, right? When Word of God is received, when Word of God is believed, and and uh, when people, uh, when Word of God is sown in people's hearts, right? That is what will give the increase, right? That is what will renew people's minds and there is transformation. It's only because of the Word, right? Um, and God works. Um, based on the word of god based on his word and he he confirms the preaching of his word with his presence so it's very important that we uh, preach the word of god right? the content being the center of um, being um, the word of god at center right now the second thing that we looked at was um, last class chapter 6 we looked at how to study the word of god and we looked at the first one which is um, um, the word study Right, we um, we take a word and then we we study that word. We go into the depths depths of that word. We see, okay, what does it mean, right? And then we we do a word study of it. Okay, so it has its benefits. It has its scope. Then we also looked at um, the topical study, right? So uh, topical study meaning a theme, right? So we looked at a theme. It could be a it could be a doctrine. It could be something like faith. It could be gifts of the spirit. It could be anything, right? Uh, in the Bible. So a topic. What does the Bible say about this topic, right? So what does God? What does Bible say about about business, for example? What does the Word of God say? Right? What does the Word of God say about you know parenting, about marriage, and so on? So. It's a topic. It's a thematic study, and we can study the Word of God in that in that manner also, right? So uh, we choose a topic. We look at, look at any uh, and every instance uh, of what the Bible says about that particular topic, right? And then we we do a study, uh, and that that can be a very fulfilling thing. That can be a very um, uh, knowledgeable exercise as well. As well. Right, where we get to understand, okay, this is what God thinks about this particular topic. And this is what God's thoughts are. This is what God's ideas are. This is the biblical stand, right? So we are, um, it builds faith in us and uh, we are sure of these areas, you know, what even what seems to be like difficult areas, we are so sure of it when we do a topical study, right? Then the third one, we, we, I think just looked at was a character study. We are studying. You can study about the biblical characters like Abraham and Moses, and and uh, do a study of that, and uh, you know how they encountered God, how they lived for God, the kind of challenges they faced, the the strengths that they had, the weaknesses, and so on. And uh, so that's something that we can um, do. Okay, and uh, yeah, and I think we we just looked at how. Um, we need to kind of understand that when we do a uh, typically when we do a Bible st a character study, we need to understand in what dispensation of time or covenant they lived in. Okay, um, for example, they could be living in a dispensation before the cross, and we know that the way the Holy Spirit ministered in those times. Um, was slightly different from the way he ministered after the cross. What was the difference? Anyone? Sorry? The, the way in which the Holy Spirit ministered in the dispensation before the cross was different from the way he ministered after the cross. Right? So what what is that? What is that difference? Main difference. Same Holy Spirit, right? Through the ages, but before the cross, after the cross, there is a there is a difference in which he ministered, he engaged with people. So, um, Pastor, can I answer? Yes, yeah, Pastor, sure. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. 
Pastor, before the cross, the Holy Spirit spoke to the through the prophets, but yeah. the after the uh, cross, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Hmm. So uh, we see that the Holy Spirit um, came upon people. Thank you. Um, so they came upon people for a time, for a season, for an assignment, even right to to enable that person to carry that out. Um, but in the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, like one who um, receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, the Holy Spirit indwells. So therefore, we see that the way uh, we do not have to, for guidance or to hear from God, saying, what is God saying? You know, I don't understand. We don't have to run and we don't have to be dependent on one person. Right, we have the scriptures. We have the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Lord will confirm, you know, His word through the church. You know, through the other believers, through whom He has called for that particular kind of ministry, like a prophetic ministry, and so on. He will confirm the word, right, which is already put in His heart. So put in our heart. So so that is a, a basic way which we which we see in which He, you know. Uh, the Holy Spirit ministers across the dispensation. So, so some of the things which they say and do may not be directly applicable, or did may not be directly applicable in our lives, right? So that is something we need to understand. Like, this, for example, the psalmist says uh, in the in, in Psalm, which Psalm is that? Psalm fifty, or he uh, says, um, "Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me." Does he say that? Yeah. Uh, which Psalm is that? Let's just read that out. Um, Psalm 51 and verse 10, right? Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Okay, so this is what he says. So, since you're doing a character study, and this is what David prayed, so this seems to be a good prayer that, you know, we should also pray that. And, uh, you know, so will it be applicable for us? What do you think? Huh? Very much. But what part is not applicable? Yeah, that is not applicable. But the rest of it is, you know, create in me a clean heart, you know, and renew a steadfast spirit. Don't cast me away from your presence and, and all that. Yes, it's a, it's a cry of a sincere heart. To God and you know wanting more of God, etc. Um, and th therefore, you know, uh, yeah, we can. Also, the fact that God says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit will, you know, be with you forever. So this thing of this fear of the Holy Spirit leaving us, or this fear that okay, uh, the Holy Spirit will abandon or God will abandon, that is not for a New Testament believer. Right? Yes, the Holy Spirit will convict us, and yes, we we can actually reject the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right? We can be in total defiance of the leading of the Holy Spirit, and and like we saw in Hebrews ten, we can actually come to a place of just trampling underfoot, you know, the things of God and rejecting, you know, the Spirit of Grace. We can do that, but you know, this this thing, this prayer of you know, uh, take not your spirit from me is not really applicable for us as New Testament believers. Right? So things like this. So when we when we do a character study, we need to be mindful of that. Right? Always, we can't directly, you know, like cut and paste what's happening in their lives uh, into our lives. Right? But definitely, we can learn a lot uh, about their faith about the, the way they interacted with God, the way they related to God. We can learn a lot, right? Okay. Next one is, uh, is a book study. Okay, so we do a study of the book, and it's, um, it involves a lot more effort than maybe a word study, right? Uh, it depends. So it, it involves certain themes which are there in the book. So when you take a book, uh, for example, a book in the Bible, it will have multiple themes right if you for example if you look at uh, first corinthians right um it has multiple themes in it right first of all he talks about division in the church right? that's 
and then he talks about um uh, how about purity holiness right immorality in the church he addresses that then he talks about the life of the believer where the believers are you know suing each other there's legal lawsuits against one another so he talks about that then he talks about uh, paul writes about the principles in marriage right he writes about marriage he writes about um you know the holiness in marriage and so on then he he uh, writes about self denial he writes about uh, idolatry he writes about head coverings he writes about food offered to idols about the lord's table you know so he say multiple things are there then we know you know this 1 corinthians 12 13 14 writes about the use of the gifts of the spirit in the church and so on so we see multiple topics multiple themes are addressed in a book so that's that's one of the things that we see okay um it can be a challenge but it can also be a very uh, very fruitful time right so um it takes time it takes commitment very rewarding very fruitful right so when we look at uh, each book we can study the book in its in its context right who wrote what was in who were the intended audience and uh, how do they go about writing this right why did they write this for example if you look at 1 corinthians we see that paul had gone to corinth he had spent about 18 months there started the church right and from there he moved on to ephesus and other places then he hears about um i'm sorry is there anyone lifted their hands yeah angel in mercy um you have a doubt or question um yeah feel free to ask okay i okay, can no worries yeah so um so we see that um you know when you look at corinthians we see that okay uh he moved he was there he taught established the church went moved from there went to ephesus um he was there for about 3 years so he hears uh, uh in this macedonian region uh, when he was there and he hears about a report of the church in corinth okay there, there is this family chloe and her household so they actually get back to paul and then they say you know there's some things that are happening in church there are challenges there are difficulties there's divisions there's you know all these problems are in the church and then paul decides to you know write to them and to set things in order right so we get to know about the historical background of how it came to be and when we do a book study we also learn about the place corinth itself so we get to see that it's a very uh, you know very uh, economically very um, upward you know place where there was a lot of commerce happening it was a port city um, it was uh, a lot of business was happening okay uh, and paul himself as a tent maker along with akila and priscilla and you know he also was supported himself through that a trade right so we read about uh, that marketplace being called as agora and people came to buy and sell and so on so we read about that right um we also learn about the spirituality of that place what was the spiritual background of that church historically okay this is what it was um we get to hear about the economic side of it like money and everything then we also get to learn about the spiritual side of it because we see that there was a temple uh they they worship the de deity uh, aphrodite and and uh, this temple was there and uh, this temple which is the biggest structure of those times and it was uh, there was such immorality in the temple there were these temple prostitutes and it writes about you know you, you learn about them and this is this is all historical evidence right so this kind of a worship was normal in corinth so you can understand if worship or like this is normal you can understand the morals or values of those in families and the common man at what kind of values so spiritually very immoral very dark right place corinth and in such a place there is this church with all these popular culture around there is this light in the darkness and the, now the church is having problems Uh, some of it is because of you know some kind of compromise and values and so on 
so paul is now writing to them so you get to understand all this and it, it and so we get to uh learn the scriptures in context right so some of the ways by which we can study you know uh, a simple five point thing is to make an outline of the book look for, look for keywords or phrases what are these words that are repeated what are these phrases that are repeated for example in this uh, in Corinth Corinthians we we re, we see that Paul is saying and now about this now about this topic uh, now regarding head coverings right now about spiritual gifts so on so we see that he there are several things that he's addressing in that book uh, in, in that epistle right um identify we can identify the main themes main ideas the key verses right this is something to do uh, we can do what are the main applications you know every section in that book when he's addressing a particular theme there is an application of it application meaning what is this truth that i can apply in my life what do i take away and put it in my life right so there is this main key areas or main applications and and of course we can study the background of the book so in a book study you know book study is a way another way of studying the bible we can do that as well okay um then another way or the fifth way of studying the bible is to do an inductive study okay so inductive study so basically in this whole um you know topic of logic and and so on there are two ways of methods of reasoning okay one is deductive and the other one is inductive so deductive when we say deductive reasoning it's from the general you move to the specific like for example you look at uh, you know what is uh, for example it could go like this you know um deductive reasoning would be like okay what is the what is the world like uh, what is going on in the world um does the world have intelligent design okay therefore it has to be a there has to be a creator okay deductive reasoning could move from there to okay so we know that things are creative things have intelligence so it has to have a design it has to have a creative or intelligent designer then we move from there to okay who is this designer right Uh, did it did these things come into being just like that if it is a creative or intelligent designer who could it be what could be the character so you move from the general to the specific that is deductive reasoning okay so when we look at inductive reasoning okay we move from specific observations okay to generalizations and theories okay so specific things so for example if we look at um, let's say we take a bible passage and if you want to do an inductive study we first thing we will you know observe what is in the text what does that passage talk about right questions like this what does this passage say okay what does this passage mean okay he's saying this is me what does it mean what is god telling me when i go through this passage how am i encouraged how am i strengthened and things like is there sin in my life for which confession and repentance is needed because this passage seems to be addressing this topic right and how can i be changed how can i learn and grow um in what way are these precepts or principles that this bible passage is talking about in what way is it affecting me in what way is it relating to me right uh, and what is actually keeping me from listening to god right so all these kind of questions we can actually ask when we actually study a passage so that's a inductive study right where we ask these questions what can how can i apply it how what what with with the passage that i've seen how how can i model it how can i teach it right um and also things like okay what does god want me to do with this now do i share it with others uh, how do i do it and all those things right so the application part is next so first step would be the observation then the interpretation and then the application part so when we look at application a little bit of you know a little more of the hermeneutics whatever we we looked at um as interpreting the bible is is important that we get to know this okay let's look at a few of them okay now a passage might we might find a passage to be a little bit of a complex a little bit of a 
problem. Okay. Now we need to look at that passage and also you know look at what is it that is making it a problem. What is the opposing view that is making it a problem? Okay, so um, the, there's a problem passage. That's a difficult passage. You know, for example, let me look at. Um, okay, let's look at one Corinthians chapter fifteen. Okay, one Corinthians chapter fifteen, and uh, let's look at verse twenty nine. Okay, verse twenty nine. Um, can somebody read that? Now, if there is no resurrection, mm. what will those who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Yeah. And then he goes on to say, you know, why do we stand in jeopardy or danger every hour and so on? Right. So he's, he's talking about uh, people, he's addressing people who are, who are of the opinion that there is no resurrection that is what 15 chapter 15 starts right um, moreover brethren i declare to you uh, etc and then he says um, he talks about eyewitnesses and all that so if verse 12 if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead so that is what he's addressing right what are people saying that there is no resurrection from the dead so he's addressing that Right, giving them proof and giving them uh, the word itself, uh, how there is a resurrection. So then, in in saying that, verse twenty nine, what does he say? He says, "What will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead?" So he's talking about some practice which was there, where. Something was done by the living for the sake of the dead. Okay, now that becomes a problem when we when we when we read that. Why why is there a problem? Because we know that no matter what we do in life, we cannot do for the sake of the those who are already dead, right? So I cannot do something. I cannot receive the gospel. I cannot receive forgiveness on the basis or you know, for the sake of those who are already dead. I cannot do that. Right? And so that is a wrong, wrong teaching. That is a wrong, wrong thing. Um, that person, one has to come into a living, loving relationship with the Lord and they have to do it on their own. I cannot, you and I cannot do it for the sake of others. Very clear, right? So now he is saying, hey, but how can... Uh, you know, those who, if the dead don't rise at all, why then are they baptized? So which means there is some kind of a baptism that was happening for the sake of the dead. And he is he's talking about that. right? So that is an opposing view. right? It's like it doesn't seem to sit with the rest of scripture. right? So what could be an alternative interpretation of that? Right? So this is what the text seems to say, that there was baptism. And there was it was happening for the sake of the people who are already dead, and this was being done in that time, right? So he's pointing that out. So what could be the alternative thing? The alternative thing is this: uh, that this was a, something that was prevailing in culture. Okay, this was prevailing in culture. So that is that is how do we get that when we check the the history? When we check the historical background of what was happening in culture during that time, so we see that extra biblical account of yes, there was this practice that was happening there, and it was not biblical, but people were doing that in the hope that it will somehow affect the person who is dead, so that when they are resurrected, when they when the time of resurrection happens, you know it will be for their better. It was a false teaching or a false uh, practice. Uh, yeah. Um, who was that? Uh, yeah, Gertrude. Uh, sister. Yeah, go ahead, please. After I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you mean to say the people uh, before burial, they were baptized? No, no, no. It is it, very clear that it was for the sake of the dead. So it's not talking about somebody who was... Let's say you're asking if somebody is dead and they are being baptized. Yeah, and, 
No, yeah. he's talking about you know someone else who is actually undergoing baptism for the sake of someone who is already dead as a substitute. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Pastor. So he's Thank addressing you. that practice, right? So, um, so the thing is this: the alternative is that, yeah, it was a wrong practice, but it was a practice which was done with the intention that there will be resurrection. Okay. Behind that belief is the fact that hey, there is a resurrection. Therefore, I am desperate that the person who has died there needs to be some kind of change, some kind of impact. Maybe when he was living, when she was living. They did not, you know, the, they did not accept the Lord, whatever, and somehow, you know, desperately doing something so that when the resurrection happens, uh, you know, their destiny will be changed. No wrong belief, but he's pointing to the belief that they had that they did, in fact, believe in the resurrection. That is what he's pointing to. And these people, why did they do it? Because they knew that there will be a resurrection so he's addressing the people who said that there is no resurrection he's saying hey this is something that you guys are doing this is what i see you people are doing this why would you do it if there is no resurrection so he's you know addressing over and over again he's addressing that um, that particular question you know why do you say that there is no resurrection Right. So when we, uh, you know, these are things to keep in mind when we study, when we look at the context, when we consider the historical background, it gives us a better understanding. Right. Um, so check the uses of the word in the same book. Uh, we can check the uses of the word in any other book, for example, any other author uh, in the in the Bible and see uh, how does it um, how does it change is there a change in the meaning is there a change in you know how uh, uh, the 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 meaning of what it's conveying right we can also list the pro and con evidence for each interpretation so for example if if we say that they are actually being baptized for the sake of the dead so what is the what is the you know what is the advantage of it well according to the rest of scripture there is no advantage right but the but the uh, the con or the, or the disadvantage is that it's a wrong teaching, right? So, so you can weigh the pros and cons of uh, the advantages and disadvantage of evidence of each of these interpretation, right? Um, then, um, yeah, I'm just going through that uh, on page 21, right? Spell out the application for the original audience. What is the application of this particular truth for the audience today, universal audience? And uh, what is the application for our personal life and ministry? Okay. So as we interpret, we see, okay, what would be the application for this original intended audience of this particular passage that we saw, this verse that we saw? Okay. For the original audience, what is the application? What do you think? For the believers in Corinth at that time, to whom the letter letter went and they read it out, right? So what is the the for? So they are the original audience, right? So for them, what would be the application of this particular instruction? What do you think? How would they apply this instruction in their lives? Anyone? How would they apply it? No, 1, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. He refutes something, right? So how would they... Pastor, yes. is it that uh, they have to uh, be baptized themselves and not to be baptized on behalf of somebody else? Because if they believed in the resurrection of the uh, dead, that they have to be baptized themselves. Mm. Right. So the the application would be twofold. Okay. One is the first, the core thing which he is actually establishing is that the truth of the fact that there is a resurrection. Right. There is the resurrection of the dead. So that's the basic thing that is. Uh, that is actually getting to, right? So that's the application. So in our um, belief, in our believing, if there is 
a wrong belief that there is no resurrection, this life is all that we have, this physical life, then there needs to be a change of that, right? That there is a resurrection. So that is that is the instruction for the original audience, right? The second one is that that one cannot do something as a substitute for those who are already gone, gone on, right? There's nothing that you can do to change that, there's nothing you can do to affect that in any way, right? Then it would become a salvation of works and not of faith, right? Um, so, so these two things, you know, these twofold application was what was for the original audience, right? For those people to whom the letter was addressed, those in the church at Corinth, right? Um, secondly, for us, as the universal audience, right? For thus, for the, for us to whom this this word is also applicable, it's the same thing, right? That there cannot be a, a practice of salvation of works. There cannot be a practice of substitution work where we substitute for our belief, our faith impacts someone else, someone else's salvation. They cannot be, right? Someone else who does not believe, someone else is totally against, you know, it cannot happen that way, right? Um, so, so these are some things um, that we can apply in our lives, but we need to interpret, you know, if it's a problem passage like this, then we interpret it rightly so that we can apply it with the intention of applying it in our lives, okay? So, so uh, we look at uh, these several ways by which we can study the Word of God. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Master, how different is it uh, when we are like uh, this uh, word study topic, different types of word yeah, study? Yeah. How is it so different from preparing a sermon? Oh, okay. How is it different from preparing a sermon? No, no. The thing is, um, uh, it's not different. It's uh, this actually study helps us to prepare. We and when we are preparing uh, with the intention of preparing for a sermon, all these different ways are valid methods are valid methods of preparing i mean methods of preparing uh, to study the word of god all these are valid yeah so so that's the thing so it, these are valid ways of studying the word of god so um you know when we come to preparing the word okay what is it that you want to share yeah is it on that particular word is it on that particular passage is it a uh, you know book that you want to you know do an exposition of? So all that would come into play. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Get through it, please. Pastor, as I understand now, when you prepare a sermon, you mm -hmm. choose a theme, then mm -hmm. you write the introduction, mm -hmm. and then you choose the main points, the conclusion, and mm -hmm. then what you take away from that uh, understanding the, of that theme. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So that that is one way. That is one way of uh, doing it, like where okay. you have a theme, right? Where you have a topic, where you have a theme, and based on that topic, uh, you have those main main points as an outline. We're yeah. going to look at that in detail. Uh, we okay. have those main points, and you could have, you know, for each of those main points, an application, or, you know, summing up those five points, whatever, and then you have one main application, right? So we can, it can be either of that, right? So this is one way of doing it, but you can, it can be, a, you know, the topic that you're, that you're looking at can be a, can be a book study as well, right? It can be a passage okay. study. So it can be uh, anything of that sort. Yeah. And we can take a reference from uh, other sermons, right, Pastor? We can uh, look into other sermons that have been preached and then take some valid information from there, or is it has to be all your own? Yeah, I mean, we can definitely learn from other, and then there's and there's value in that, you know, like people have actually meditated, prayed, and then they've um, shared, and definitely we can learn and we can use um, whatever understanding we have, definitely we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Right. Sure. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, let's um, let's just move on to, uh, to look at how the Lord ministered the Word. Okay. So, so, these methods are different ways of studying the Word. All are valid. 
all are useful so we can we can do all this right in our personal study and and this definitely has value um, in studying the word of god and we need to have an understanding of the word of god right so this will help us and to do it in an ongoing manner okay right so um how did the lord minister the word okay so uh, some let's look at some of those things which um okay uh, just one second uh, how did the lord minister the word okay. so we see that the lord actually spoke a word in season a timely word okay so what do we mean by that you know if you look at isaiah 40 uh, sorry 50 verse 4 and 5 says the lord has given me the tongue of the learned that i should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary he awakens me morning by morning he awakens my ear to hear as the learned the lord god has opened my ear and i was not rebellious nor did i turn away okay so isaiah 50 so it talks about uh, a word in season okay so what is a word in season a word in season a timely word hmm okay so something that we are going through that particular frame of mind a uh, frame of time uh, so which is what we call as a season so a timely word maybe it's a it's a need maybe it's a challenge uh, you know whatever it is could be whatever it is that could be but then this word ministers to that particular need right so it's a it's a timely word so in the life of the lord jesus was there a timely word that he ministered to people from whatever you've read in the gospels and you know what is it that um, that we see uh, in isaiah when he reads the scroll that you know the spirit of the lord has anointed me to preach the good news of the poor and uh -huh. so was that a timely word for that uh, <coughs> for that particular synagogue that time and that uh, yeah i guess it could be anything more specific that we can think of uh, turn into wine at that time what what a turn to wine what he did um yeah that was in that point of need it fulfilled that need yes um yeah mm yeah right and um, and also some of those uh, some of the miracles that he did were even like going to jairus house right um jairus house J jairus comes to call and call him his daughter is unwell and he gets a good gets a bad report a uh, terrible report that the daughter is no more so don't trouble the master immediately the lord turns around and looks at him and says you know do not be afraid only believe right immediately he just turns around and gives him a word word of assurance a word if jairus were to take that will build faith in his heart right immediately he just releases that word so it was you know a very timely um also with the woman at the well right that also was a word in season for her and she was going through you know this rejection she was going through humiliation and all that and here comes the word of knowledge um right at that right moment when she comes to the well and then is it you know yes in in, in engaging in that conversation he says yeah you have you know you've been married before um and you had five husbands and the one with whom you are living is now not your has been a very timely word of knowledge right that kind of shook her got her attention but it was given with so much grace and then led to her repentance and led to her you know witnessing to others come and see all that the lord uh, you know he told me all that uh, i had done and so on right so so the lord spoke a timely word okay so this isa 50 and verse 4 talks about uh, a word in season to him who is weary right so uh, how does that you know that come you know he awakens me morning by morning he awakens my here year to hear as the learned right so 
it's a spirit led you know god prompted word that we receive and it's a timely word that in helps the person who needs it right okay in line with that the second thing that we see is that he spoke what he heard the father speak right um many times he says that he testifies that right john chapter 8 26 28 i have many things to say to you and to judge concern concerning you but he who sent me is true and i speak to the world those things which i heard from him okay he's talking about having out of this communion with the father whatever things he heard whatever words that he received that is what he is speaking right that is what he is communicating right um Verse 27, they did not understand when he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. You know? So his eyes were on the Father, his ears were constantly you know, in tune to what the Father was speaking, and so he, he said, uh, he taught and he spoke based on that. Right? Um, John chapter 7, verse 14, uh, when the Lord goes to the temple and uh, everyone is marveling, you know, how does this man know the scriptures and how does this man know letters, never having studied? Then Jesus answered them, saying, My doctrine is, is not mine, but his who sent me. Okay, so he's receiving everything from the from the Father. Right? So that's how he spoke. So in studying how the Lord ministered, there's something that we can actually put to practice in our own lives, right? So a timely word is something that, you know, like we were, that question, right? How do we prepare for the sermon? You know, these while these methods are valid to study the word of God, we can actually, you know, it's a privilege to lean on to the spirit of God. It's can, to lean in and be sensitive to what the Lord is saying, what the Lord is speaking, to receive a timely word. Right, a word that is required maybe for one on one, maybe a word, maybe it's a it's a counsel or you know counseling or whatever it is, a timely word. Maybe God just you know wakens us, gives us a word for someone, and whom we have not even thought of, but then God puts that word so that we can share that. Right. Then again about hearing what the Father is speaking. Yes, there is value in us, you know, learning, studying, and uh, you know, gathering this information uh, on the from the Word of God, and there is value. We need to do that, but also to hear what the Father is speaking. Now that is revelation, right? Based on what we have learned, what we have studied, to hear what the Father has to say about that—that that is the revelation, right? To receive that, okay. The third thing that we see in the life of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, is that he spoke with wisdom. Okay. What is wisdom? It is the ability to use the knowledge. Right? The ability to use the knowledge is wisdom. So John chapter 7, verse 44, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, why have you not brought him? Okay, So this is what they asked him. They did not, they did not arrest these officers who came with the intention of arresting. So they ask, why have you not brought him? What was the response? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Okay. No one ever spoke like this. We never, we've never heard anyone speak like it. Okay. Now, you know, it was in a culture where there were great, great orators and people who were, uh, you know, uh, very articulate and all that. It was in that culture, but they're saying no one ever spoke like him, referring to the wisdom, referring to the you know authority which with the with which he spoke. Um, Matthew chapter thirteen, verse fifty four. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, "Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works?" So he spoke with wisdom, the wisdom that comes from the from the word of God, right? Not human wisdom, but he spoke with wisdom that comes from the word of God, right? Um, Luke chapter 4 also, uh, 
it says that his word the, the word that he spoke was with authority okay what is authority um it's like keys <laughs> okay yeah so the ability to wield power right so uh it, it you can say it's influence or you have the ability to wield the power you've already been given power but you the ability like for example uh, uh like a policeman like you see a security guard or a policeman you know the ability they have the ability but they have been given the authority now all of us have the ability to guide traffic and we can go put our hand and you know stop the traffic and then say okay you go this side etc all of us have the ability right but do we have the authority no we don't right whereas uh, a policeman he has been uh, given the authority vested with the authority to go and do it right yeah so yeah so the he spoke with authority he spoke as as someone who who has this who wielded this authority okay uh, another thing that we see is there is more to do with his character right he ministered the lord jesus ministered with a with a humility right with um, the matthew chapter 11 verses 28 and 29 the lord says come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul so um so the lord is talking describing himself and he's saying i'm gentle and i'm lowly in heart he's talking about humility um and whatever he spoke and he ministered he came from a place of humility so that's also something for us to learn okay so we'll stop here and we'll continue next class right thank you